Ron, mate, don't t- remind me. Don't, fa- don't remind me. Hang on. I can't hear myself for two seconds. Hang on. Now we're on. Now I can hear myself. Uh, why, why did you decide to join up in your early 30s? Why would you... Jo- why... Right, <laughs> I've got loads of ways. <laughs> We've only been chatting for like ten. Yeah. Minutes. I've got lots. Of, I've got lots of questions. Yeah. So you had a really well or a good playing paying job. Yeah. Good paying job, and yeah. you went. Uh, I think I'll go on a thousand pound a month and become a, a submariner yeah. in the navy. Yeah. At the, at, in your thirties. When you say in your thirties, how old were you? Yeah. So I think I was thirty-one. So I, I'd been in. Um, were, you, were you dropped on your head as a child? Uh, uh, <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> I mean, at that point, I was, um, you know, I've been in oil and, oil and gas for eight years, nine, eight, coming on nine years. So, you know, I was well established in the in the corporate world, as you'd like to like to say. But, you know, I think we, we touched on it earlier. You know, I'd, my, my grandfather, who was a, a big influence in my in my life, was, you know, like a lot of that generation was, um, you know, in World War Two. Um, you know, he had a lot of stories from uh, from that time and um also some other family from that generation was lost during during that war so it's certainly growing up you know there was a lot of war stories around i'd grown up with a lot of interest in in the military i think because of that and you know i just always regretted not joining the military when i was younger you know i, I wanted i would have liked to have done it in my 20s um circumstances at the time i didn't i was talked out of it um so I didn't do it, and the, just the just the desire to, you know, serve my country and be part of the you know be part of the military and to, to give something back to the country, um, just never went away. And 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 the, and the the better I got paid in the oil and gas industry, and the more I saw the corporate side of of life, the more I hated that, and the more I just wanted to do something more meaningful, I offer myself more with better job job satisfaction shall we say that that was like the main i think the main drivers for it yeah that's interesting that is extremely different to most people that join up most people that join up are obviously 16 17 18 years old most of them yep. right and they got zero co- i'm talking about myself here as well zero corporate experience they don't have that they don't have that over over uh, that that ex- yeah, experience of it and they join up because uh well a bunch of reasons one or more of these lack of options um, lack of options, lack of uh, and uh, like a, 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 a real keen desire to do something in every street. Like, like you grow up and your parents are doctors, you're probably going to be a doctor. Yeah, you know, you, you got you know, it's like and well, case case in point, you grew up with a heavy military um, influence in your life. Yeah, you you ended up at 31, you know, yeah. joining up to serve. Like I had no one uh, in military in my in my family. They were all Second World War, yeah, but not in my immediate family. Yeah, or any of my family really. And then I joined up because it was really, for me, it was lack of options and a couple of other reasons. Um, but uh, do you think you found it harder or easier being in training compared to your counterparts? I'm assuming their ages were <coughs> y- y- like 16, 17, 18 year olds. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, it, there, were, there was myself, a couple of older guys in the, in the, in the intake when I, when I went through uh, rally. Was, um, there was another guy who'd been in the, uh, in the army had gone outside and then come back in uh, via the navy. So he, you know, he was a little bit older. But I, you know, I think I found it easier because mentally, I think I was in in a, in a you know mentally stronger than some of the younger guys in 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 certain ways because you know you've got that life experience to to draw on so you can try and you know sort of understand uh, things better and and the whole training setup and the regimes of how it's designed to work. You can sort of see that for what it is rather than letting it affect you thinking oh fucking hell this is shit or why am i doing this or why you know so i think it was easy in that respect physically you know i was in reasonable condition you know played rugby um national conference rugby league uh most of my adult life um you know i like to stay in shape so physically i didn't find it too demanding but (laughs) it's funny because the the uh the divisional officer sort of week one pulled me aside and said you know we, we do find with older guys that you know, give it a couple of weeks, and your your body will <laughs> your body will give up on you, and you know we don't expect you'll be here. But I was like, nah, well, that's not me. But you know, they, so they obviously have a have a an awareness of of that the, the the physical side for older guys. But you know, I, I found it all right. I enjoyed it. 
what was the uh, what was the physical side like? So HMS Rally is is the HMS Rally where all is that like phase one for all naval recruits? Yeah. So HMS Rally is for enlisted naval recruits, and if you were going to go straight into a commission, then you would go to Dartmouth. To where? Uh, Dartmouth. Dartmouth. Yeah. Sorry, excuse me. So the naval, the, the naval the area, college. Yeah. So they have a naval college there, <coughs> and then the the enlisted guys go in. Um, go in at, at rally. And again, you know, I did look at, at, at going in commission, but I think, I don't know, partly because of my upbringing or, or the stories I'd heard from, from like m the military experience that I'd not experienced myself, but a lot of the, the stories I'd had was like, you know, the enlisted guys or the guys, the non-commissioned guys were the guys who more often than not were doing more of the actual work or action um, and, and, and got to know the job for whatever it was better than, you know, some of the com commission guys, um, you know, and I wanted to, if I was going to do something, I wanted to understand it from from the ground up, you know, I didn't want to go in at a certain level and have no understanding of, of, of basically the, the job or, you know, I wanted a, a better understanding of, of whatever the job was going to be. So, you know, I decided to, to not even look at the commission initially. Did you, are you allowed to just choose to, to go for submariners? Because my understanding is it's, it's like a specialist area of the Navy. Again, excuse my ignorance. And for people who are, are not submariners listening to this and thinking, oh, they're not that special. Uh, pretty, I've met, I, pretty, pretty special. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> in, in many different connotations yeah, of the word. Yeah. My first experience as a submariner was, uh, a, oh God, I was a young private in three para and we did this tri-services sailing trip. It was like adventure training. Oh my God. And it was like with three, with three watches on this. It was a 55 foot there with three watches of four people. Um, all of the watches were made up of like, they were made up of power edge toms. And yeah. then the people who were running them were, were Navy. Yeah. We had like equivalent of a Navy colonel. I can't remember what his rank was. The equivalent of, an, of a, of a we, sorry, the equivalent of an army colonel, equivalent of an army, army W01. Yeah. And, there, and then there was a submariner on there. And then you had like a lot of power edge guys I, sp I spent, I mean, we were going across the Bay of Biscay as well. Right. I spent days getting sick. Like, day, it was hideous. It was horrible. Um, and it was a submariner there. And he was a nice guy. And then we, on the way, when we finished, we had to, it was a 24 hour ferry back from maybe so, 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 oh God, so Paulo, somewhere in Spain to Plymouth, maybe. And uh, yeah, he, he, he was special drinking as well yeah he, he drank very quickly very fast heavy drinkers yeah well he, yeah. he was a heavy drinker for about an hour yeah right and then if for 23 hours he racked out he racked out his understatement <laughs> he 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 spent it sat in the toilet fully clothed unconscious he defecated everywhere in his trousers on the toilet yeah. he had been sick all over himself and uh, he left the door open to his cabin because we had cabins and the whole of the corridors, about, I don't know, 100 meters of corridors, it just stank. It was stinking. Oh, it was just stinking. Yeah. Mate, it was hideous. He probably it wanted it to, to smell like a submarine. He's probably trying to, you know, bring a bit, bring that back. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Well, uh, my good friend Simon Piles, one of my Patreon supporters as well. And uh, in fact, and he's the quartermaster at the Forces Barbarians RFC, um, who I'm going to, if you're a rugby player, we're going to rope you into that. But um, yeah. he, he, he said, make sure, when I said I got you coming on, he, s he said, make sure that sludge mariner uh, puts some deodorant on before he gets <laughs> in the studio. Yeah, fair one. And what, what do you think? What was the, what was the, what, <laughs> what was the result when I turned up? Was I honking? Or? I'm undecided. Not, not no, I, mate, what are you on about? No, I can't be now. The jury's out. <laughs> not at all. Um, but the, then, back to the I, question. I had the first bath of the month for you last <laughs> night. <laughs> but back to the question. Can you just choose to be a submariner? Uh, y yes. Um, I think pretty much you can now. <clears throat> you, once you, um, in fact, I think because of the uh, the recruitment drive to get um, and retain submariners, I think you know if you were, to, the, you know, I don't know what sure it's like with the with the other branches, but the navy at the time, you know, there was different lengths of waiting lists to get in, um, depending on your branch. So that you know, some of the branches were, were oversubscribed, and if you know to get people in submarines, often you get to the top of the list and get in quicker. Um, as a submariner, um, and not only that, you um, you also offered an incentive. So you're like a golden hello. So if you are, um, if you go, I'm not sure what it's like now, but 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 when I did it, you um, offered a five grand bonus on qualification of becoming a submariner. So once you got your dolphins, you got you know five grand, but well, less tax. Um, you know, you got that as a, as an incentive to get people in because you know 
it's not the most glamorous job in the world and you know they struggle to to, to get people into it so it's not a popular one then not it wasn't not massively i mean i think it i think they f- sound not to sound like too much like an old man again but you know i think with the with the young younger generation with like technology and wanting to be on social media and wanting to have that contact with you know the outside world because submarines are the exact opposite of that for for generally long periods you know i think that's it that's a big dr- uh, drawback for getting getting people in there because you know you don't have that communication or contact talk to me then T- tell me what it's like a sub mate so, so I, I you asked me before the podcast have i been in a sub yes i have so when we came back to plymouth i think it was plymouth or portsmouth one of those p places on the south coast right um jumper which was the nickname of the submariner yeah. i can't remember his actual name collins probably what his surname was probably collins if he was jumper why is that that's oh, just a jack thing you know if it's Collins, you're probably Jumper Collins. That's the... Do you not have that in there? Where's it In the Paris. Yeah, well... I don't know. They just have, like, uh, if you... I think it goes back to, like, you know, World War One, World War Two. If there was, like, a famous person of the same name, then you would get... That would be a nickname, would become whoever that was. Yeah. And so, I, so I don't... Is Jumper Collins a famous person? And I only remember, because one of my... One of my best mates going through uh, submarine school was Collins, Jumper Collins. And that's how I got to hear about that date. And I think it was probably some... Some random old, you know, long jumper from the, you know, from the forties or something, right. some I, nonsense, I but that, uh, things like that stick. <coughs> yeah, that's why I ask. I didn't recognise the name. Yeah, <coughs> there's issues with that. Now, I've just re- like I've had issues where I, th- uh, you probably have as well, or experienced it where I thought someone's name because I'm also a bit of a moron and quite gullible. And uh, there's a guy called Billy Smart, right? Who I knew as Billy Smart for several years yeah. until I found out his name was actually not Billy, it was something else. Right. And he was he was just called it after Billy Smart. And there's another yeah. guy recently who I've known for well, 2020. I've known him for at least 14 years. And I've just discovered his name isn't Billy. It's something else. Yeah. It, it, again, this is a different this isn't Billy Smart. This is a different Billy. Yeah. Right? It's something else. Mate, mental. Anyway, I digress. Okay, so Jumper Collins. Jumper Collins. Collins. Collins, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Um so I went on to HMS Talent. Talon? Talon. Talon. Yeah. I went to HMS Talon. And if I remember correctly, that was a nuclear... No, diesel. No, Talon's nu- uh, nuclear powered. Is it Talent or Talon? Talent. 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 Yeah. I went on to Talent. That was my first look at a sub. Uh, recollect... I mean, it's 2002 maybe? 2001 maybe? 2001, yeah. I think. Recollections. I rem- I distinctly remember how small the sleeping area was. Yeah. I don't know what you call them, the bunks. Yeah, the bunks. And th- mate, I mean, there's enough. There's enough space, if I remember, to slide yourself in onto your bed, you know, or whatever you call it. You can slide yourself in onto your bed, and then you got about a, from your the tip of your nose. If you're looking up to the ceiling, but you can't see the ceiling, the tip of your nose to then the bed above you, because like the bunk beds, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, three, mate, three, maybe three, six inches. It three was three high. Oh yeah, I mean you can't lift your neck up to to read a book. You know you have to rest the book on your chest at a weird angle, and then sort of just tilt your your head forward to try and get a, a look at it. There, it's not you know it's not glamorous in there. Talk me through life. That's sure, but you operational know, life. Tell me about it. You know it's pretty um it's pretty taxing. In the, in the fact that you've got you're on defence watches full time, so it, it, you know, two you know two different submarines. Well, you know there's different classes of submarines, but hunter killer submarines, which is what I was on, what, where you're doing um, you know like reconnaissance and intelligence gathering, um, that that kind of activity, and you've got the nuclear deterrent, which is the the V boats, um, which are you know the the nuclear um, the UK nuclear deterrent. So basically, they'll go out to sea for three months, <coughs> disappear, and just be you know just be there with the with the finger on the big red button in case things go south badly. So they they just go and, they'll go and do that. And the hunter killers are a more active active bunch. So our watches are different. So we'll do defence watches, which is six hours on, six hours off on rotation the whole time you're out. So, you know, so it's, it's very difficult to get a, a grasp of like normal, you know, days and normal days and nights because, you know, you're up, you're working for six hours, then, you, you, then you, you know, you're then you eating and, and then racked out and then you're back up again six hours later. So it's, you know, if you're out for a long period of time, it's taxing on, on you, you know, <laughs> physically and mentally, you you don't know what, you know, what day it is. What's literally. the longest you did six on, six off for? So the, the longest single spell I think I did was f- maybe five weeks. That's uh, of that of that rotation, and you, and you you know you, when you're up and working, you know you are up and working. It's 
you know, it would depend on what branch you are, but you know, it's it's you've got to be switched on, you know. That's hideous, mate. Yeah. I, I d- um, got a lot of experience with shift work from when I, I left and went out to the Middle East. Um, and I did, I spent a part of it like on the ground with like uh, protection teams, and I did spent and I spent part of it managing security on site on oil and gas sites. Yeah. And that was that was shift work, right? Yeah. And and I and there was also all the oil and gas guys. They were on sh- most of them who weren't in the HQ. They were on shift work as well, and I got the opportunity to observe the impact of shift work on people, yeah. on myself, on others. And I, there was a there was a, there was a research that came out about a year before a, a specific health impact research on shift work. Man, and one of the things I'm going to ask you about it in a minute. One of the big impacts of shift impacts of shift work on the health and the chances of long term chronic illness is. Um, is when you're doing night shifts, right? That's just one aspect, yeah. night shifts. Now, leading on from that, so, Leah, leading on from that, when you're on the sub, right, and you are in that sub for, uh, you can go you can, uh, you can go down for up to three months, right? Yeah, like, longest, worst case scenario, up to three months. Yeah, you can, you can, in right. theory, yeah. Do they, and even just five weeks, do they supplement you with your vitamins? Vitamin D, for example. Well, no, not 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 unless they de- you know they point it in the water and, and not telling anyone. But it, they they th- no, they don't give you any kind of like supplements to, to say, look, you know, you're you, you're on for this period. You you know you must take this. They don't, um, they, you know, they don't give you that. But and in fact, the water is actually worse for you than than regular tap water because they make their own water on board. It's completely pure and it's, it's free of everything so there's no you know like tap water there's no fluoride in it there's no minerals in it because you know everything's been extracted out of out of it so there's demineralized water basically so you know to you know the health benefits on the health impact is you know it's pretty harsh on your on your on your body you know given that really surprises me that because it must it must impact the quality of work and productivity when because people have, it, that is not a, that is not obviously a healthy environment to work in and yeah. I, I it's like it might I mean people listening it might or watching it might sound like I'm being a bit oh god fucking hell you know you're in no that that kind of stuff really inhibits the way you can work and operate there was a guy um, again when I was working in Iraq there's a guy he, whenever he's he was an oil oil worker he used to only work when he's coming to the country do five weeks in country and do five and then five weeks off. When he came in, he did the whole time on nights. He elected to do the whole five weeks on nights. Yeah. That bloke was like the walking dead at the end of the five weeks. Even halfway through, he was the walking dead. Yeah. And I experienced it myself as well. We used to do two weeks on nights, then four weeks on days, and two weeks on nights. I do I do an eight eight stint shift. Right. <clears throat> Here's an example of the impact of of uh, I'm preaching to convert you, but it's, it, it really it just really surprised me about the, that sub like not supplementing kind of thing. I used to do on that two weeks and nights that I do that right and um, long story short, when I was on days, I could have eight hours kip. Okay, I would go. To the, I would finish my shift. I'd have spare time because a twelve-hour shift, twelve on, twelve off. Finish my shift. I go to the gym for a couple of hours. A couple of hours, like long hard work. Yeah. Then I come in. I watch a movie in bed. I have scoff in the cookhouse, and then I get my head down. I don't need about eight hours kip. Day. Yeah. I do that for four weeks. Right, grafting. As in gym, hammering myself because my job wasn't hard physically, right? Then I go into two two weeks or nights. It's the same for the start and as at the end. And I would come off the shift. I do the gym. I find it really hard to do anything more than an hour, okay? And then I get into bed. I would sleep for like 10, 11 hours and it wouldn't be enough because, mm. and all that was down to, I put it entirely down to, no, almost entirely down to lack of sunlight, so yeah. vitamin D. Yeah. And the other one was because I was eating, when my body was used to sleeping, you can't just knock that. They call it the limbic system. Yeah, yeah. Like, you can't just you can't reverse that. Even if it did like nights for three months, your digestive system, the way your body's set up, doesn't reverse. Yeah. It's still like you, when it's nighttime, your body knows it's nighttime and it shuts down things like your digestive system. Everything's got to sleep. So that was impacting me. And that bloke was doing it for five weeks. Yeah, he was like the Walking Dead. He, like we just he could hardly hold a conversation towards the end of it. Yeah, it mental. Mental. Anyway, I'll have a word. I'll have a word with the Navy for you. And that's why submariners are all nails because they're, <laughs> you know, they, they're vetted out to be able to withstand that kind of conditions. You know. Did you notice anything like that? Well, like uh, health impacts kind of thing. Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, no, da- not directly. I mean, look, you you do look at some guys like you say, and they look like you know they've just been inside for on a long stretch, and they, you know they come out with that <laughs> prison tan. But um, yeah, no, I didn't. Know, I didn't um, notice anything. 
directly but when but then you know come to mention it when you look around and you look at like you know the senior race and the older guys who have been on for you know 20 years and they do look fucked they you know like you said they look like the walking dead but you, you see with the night shift work and that study was on about they found i'm trying to remember the numbers i'll have to look it up again but they found that your risk for example of getting diabetes type 2 diabetes yeah. went up by something like 30 percent just from doing night shifts for prolonged periods yeah that like that's a huge amount. You know, your risk of getting a heart disease went up by X amount of percent. But I can't remember the figures, but it was huge. I'm yeah. thinking, Jesus Christ. I mean, I don't know whether... You do get extra extra pay for being uh, qualified submariner. You, you, so you get extra extra pay on top of your normal naval pay for being a qualified submariner, but then also you get extra pay when you're a, when you're away on a on a boat for, for a period of time. You know, I don't know whether they, that's their way of compensating you for, you know, for, for that risk. I don't know. But, you know, you've got that. Plus... You know, no exaggeration. The nuclear powered boats, and you know, they, you've seen how small they are. And sometimes, you know, if you're on, you know, if the if the if the boats working really hard and the you know the reactors flashed up, you know, burning strong, there's places you can't even sit in the mess because the radiation's that high coming through the <laughs> coming through the walls. That no. you know, you literally you'll go into the mess one day, and half of it's you know, there's a bit of yellow tape across the, the table and you can't sit in that corner because the radiation is too high, but but you're all right if you if you sit this oh side God. and have your wets. But that's Jen, you know. <laughs> some 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 days that, that that is what it's like, you know, and they won't or they won't even let you you know, the reactors um, you know, on the on the submarine, um, you know, where it is and and, and um so, sometimes you you know they won't even allow you to go, to walk over it to go to to the back because you know because of the risk is like, is like too high. So like Jen Jen, you, there's obviously like some some nasty things going on there. That is mental. Yeah. Isn't that mental? I know. In, well, in this day, in this like risk averse day and age as well, you think you know that's brilliant how it can still be allowed to happen. But but you know the the T boats, which is the class of boats I was on, which is Talent was um, Triumph, uh, and that and that and that era of boats, you know, the nuclear powered, but they're inside as well. They're like an old World War Two boat. You know, there's pipes everywhere, valves, switches, and, you know, it's kind of like that old school, um, what you'd imagine a submarine to, to be like. And, you know, and that's part of what I enjoyed about it, if I'm honest, because it is that proper, like, old school, um, you know, environment. And, and, you know, there is that a little bit of a disregard for, for health and safety because you're like, well, you know, with submariners, this is what we, we do. We get on with it, you know, so. Yeah, and you yeah. and that's that's sort of admirable as well. You know, I can see that's, at, you know, that 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 sort of, uh, what, what's it? You just get used to the hardship. This is where we do it. We're doing an important job. I yeah. can understand. I can yeah. understand. Oh, I mean, and if you look, you know, like any any military unit, you know, has their pride and their history. And I think submariners, I think they do get forgotten about a lot, especially in sort of modern um, warfare or modern conflicts because you, they do, you don't always hear about you know what they're doing because of the nature of what they're doing but you know they're doing you know some really early stuff and then you look at the history where you know during world war ii they lost you know if you take them if you take the submarine service as a as a, as a unit as a whole you know the the percentage of men they lost within that unit was even higher than bomber command you know the the fatality rate of, of being a submariner during the war the, the percentage of the guys they lost was was insane you know when you look they lost maybe 74 or 79 boats with you know 70 to 100 guys on each one is is in is incredible and you know churchill had that famous quote where you know he said you know of all the men and, and women in the armed forces no no man faces you know more no man has a greater commitment or faces a greater peril than than the submariners because you know if things go bad you know things go bad in a big way and you know you're not getting out of there and you know even in in modern day you still go out there with that at the back of your mind you know there's the certain places you go in the sea you know if you and if you're over a certain depth or you know you're over the continental shelf and the and the oceans you know m massively deep you know that if things go bad there you're not getting there's no there's no way of rescue there's no way of escape and you just you you know you're gone so i mean it is it and i think people don't get to hear about that as much which you know i think tomorrow's deserve a bit of credit for for you know for that yeah i don't know where you're gonna get the credit from I ain't i'm not sure it. but I, get, I haven't decided yet yeah <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you know, I'll just keep pointing it out there, and hopefully one day I'll say, yeah, fucking hell, some Mariners. Yeah, fair play, mate. They're, they're decent. But, um, you know, we're living hope, aren't we? <laughs> mate, I was only joking. Talk to me about, talk about, talk about life on it. So on a date, like, what did you... First off, what job did you do in the submarine? Um, so I was in um, TSM, so uh, part of the warfare branch. So basically... Uh, the primary role, I guess, of that is to um, is target acquisition for you, you. So if you're fighting the the boat, it's basically working out where you're sending the um, our torpedoes, basically, or or the you the, the tea lamps. So we work out the give them like the fire coordinates, basically. So you you you're responsible for you know work working out what the target is. You know, you get the sonar guys who who will do the identification work you know if you're not working from visuals and they're working from sound you know they'll 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 have like the signature of whatever it is you're tracking a you know foreign carrier for example they'll, they'll probably have a bottle of being out there recorded the the signature of what it sounds like so then when you pick it up again then then they can say well you know this is we're pretty sure certainly this is this is that what it is and then you work out what using their um, the information fed from the sonar, where it is, how fast it's moving, taking into account where we are, how fast we're moving, and work out a, a fire solution, basically saying, like, this is the solution. Um, so a big, a big part of the role was that. But the, the, the good thing about that warfare branch was you got you got to do navigation, so you got to do uh, navigation by radar, you got to do a bit of periscope watch keeping, so getting on the old periscope and having a, have a little nose around with that. Um, and then you got to do ship protection stuff as well. So you got to do a bit of the the more military stuff. So, you know, the um, CQB, um, boarding ships, defending the ship against, you know, whatever that may be. So it, it, was good. it was a good balance because you got to do a bit of that, what you guys would call soldiering, I guess. But then you still got a lot of the, the maritime naval stuff as well, which was the, the main component of it. So no, I, I enjoyed that, that as a branch. What uh, what? Oh, what was the name of that branch again? Sorry, um, TSM. TSM. Yeah, so tactical tactical submariner they call it. So basically, it's to do a little bit of everything with the warfare. What uh, what small arms weapon systems did you carry on the on the boat? Were they SA? SA eight is, but negative suicides because of the radiation risk. So you know, if um, if you if you dropped one, like and the tritium in there. Yeah, the they? tritium. Yeah. That would that could potentially poison the whole atmosphere of the boat. So you, so you had to go like old school iron sights. Which is even more alley, isn't it? Even more kudos to the to the submariners. Sa- well, <laughs> it's alley in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> it's alley in the jungle. But, um, were, they, were you on the carbines? But yeah, yeah the, on the short yeah, the barrel, the, the carbines. Yeah, Okay, I thought you might have said something different, but then there's no point. No, it? and then on a couple of GPNGs that you could mount on the on the fin. Right. Yeah, I got you. But um, yeah, so that, that that was it basically. So daily routine. Talk me through daily routine. You're on the sub. You just, you've just, you've just gone, you've just gone, you've just, what's the word when you you push off, you deploy? Yeah, so you, uh, you, you leave the, when you leave the wall and you go to harbour stations, it's the first thing you do, which basically is just navigating the, the boat out of wherever you are. Um, and then everyone has a specific job for, for that. Um, and you'd probably be doing that for about an hour. And then once once the whole boat's done that, then you fall into your watches. So first watch and second watches, which is when you pick up your your six on six off rotation. So they you know they serve meals like normal breakfast, lunch, and tea. But depending where you are, you might be getting up from your rack to your feet, you know, for your evening scran. But then you just come in on watch or whatever. So you you, know, you would do your watch, and then um, you know then we we would have your meal and and then rack out. And then you know showers, optional. <laughs> <laughs> but no, honestly, I mean, I, I think you know the, the submariners do get a bad rep for as well for for not being the most hygienic. But in our defence, you know, a lot of the time you're out, uh, depending on what you're doing. Again, you can't get you know the sh- the water's off. You're not allowed to get a shower because they, you know they need to conserve water because of whatever we're, you know we're doing. So. You know, sometimes you don't even have the ch- the, the choice to, to to get a washer. You just get used to stinking. I think you're making a mistake of addressing the issue. Yeah, you're making a mistake. Of addre- well, you and brought I, you brought it up, so I, I like to. I, I know the feeling because you know. I I serve a three para, and they got the nickname Gun G Three. Right. Which nice. I'm not going to go any further with that conversation than that because I'm not because I don't want to fan the flames. Right? No. But I shower regularly. Right. <laughs> you apparently don't. No. no. <laughs> Well, old habits die hard. What can I say? 
Um, so that's it. You, you, you settle into your watches. What about, what's, oh, I don't know if you could talk about it. How does things change? No, I don't know if you can talk about it. I was going to ask you about, about alert states and how things change. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you obviously get ver- various states. And if you go to like, action stations, basically, if you, you know, if you were on, uh, you know, if you're tracking something, for example, and you came into contact with it, then you would be on action stations. So then you would, you know, obviously on a high alert, uh, higher alert. So the people are, are manning um, even the stations you're on. Like, you'll probably have... You know, if it's that serious, then you probably have one or two guys doing the the, the same thing, because, you know, just to, to double check that, you know, if, if things get real, really fast, that, the, you know, we're accurate in, in what we're doing. So for action stations, things become even more intense, um, than, you know, than, than, than they already are. But you, you're kind of in a, that state of alert the whole time anyway. And because there's so many things can go wrong on, on, a, on a boat without any, um, you know, uh, for, foreign action or, or foreign contact but just because of the nature of the submarine you know you need to be switched on because one you know press do the wrong thing at the wrong time and you know there's a the whole host of stuff can go wrong on the on the boat itself when when is when you when when you have to go to action stations what happens what happens to the watch that's on rest so do, depending on what it is depending on on the nature of it most of eight you know, maybe most of the time it's dealt with by the on watch guys. But if it's if it's that serious, which is not you know it not always is, but you know there is times when it's that serious and, and and then everyone's up, everyone's up and in position fighting the boat because then you know you're in a position there where you know everything needs to be manned because you you know you might be doing evasive maneuvers or you might be doing something um, you know more dangerous and and the risk of of losing the boat is, you know, is real to, to, to whatever that may be. So, you know, every station needs to be manned. And I think, you know, we mentioned the dolphins earlier on, you know, part of getting your dolphins is you need to understand um, how to fight and operate the boat pretty much yourself as a, as a single submariner. So the, the responsibility you have is that you could be, you know, in the, in the forward escape compartment, for, for example, something could go tits up with the rest of the boat all the bulkheads are isolated and you you're the only guy at the front and then you've got the uh escape hatch there that could potentially need to operate there's a um a secondary sort of weapon system there that you may need to 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 fire off there's a manual override for hydraulics and electric you know the electric system so any number of things could be going wrong and it could be down to you to to resolve it because you're the only one there isolated in, in that area of the boat. So, you know, they, they do get, you do have a lot of responsibility and you do need a lot of knowledge of, 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 of that submarine, you know, even if it's not your job, you know, a lot of it in the Navy, in the other parts of the Navy skimmers, which are the, you know, surface fleet, which is what we, what we call them is, you know, you'll go on a, on a ship and they'll be like, you know, be like, where's this mate? And they'll be like, don't know. Oh, where's this department? Don't know. It's not my job. You know, you don't get any of that on a submarine. You know, everything is your job, even if it's not your your day job. You still need to have an understanding of it because it could could, could come down to you to you know to save that that bit of the boat or get some lads off if necessary. So to clarify, submariners are better than the skimmers. One hundred percent better than skimmers, <laughs> uh, and they know it. <laughs> just just triggered everyone in the <laughs> navy. Just triggered Simon Piles. We triggered triggered Gavin Tuak. I've lost, I've lost multiple subscribers. Yeah, but you know, it's a hard truth. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the sooner they come to terms with it and move on, the better for everyone. That's what I'm saying. When did they stop smoking on submarines? Uh, that's before uh, my time, I think. But I think it was getting, I think it was up to the to the smoking ban. I think like the the national sort of smoking ban in public, but you know you can still smoke on. Well, I understand they're stopping this now. I think the navy's going to try and be the first service to be. I don't know how they worded it, tobacco free or smoke free. So they're not even going to want you to take any tobacco on board. They've done this anymore. already. I think. I think they've. Done, I think they've announced it already. Yeah. So you can't even smoke. So you can't smoke on any naval base, <clears throat> as as far as I understand it, or station or or ship or boat. Yeah. Whatever. So they, they they want to be in a negative tobacco, which you know at, at the point when I was on, you could still smoke on. You know, you could go if you were a smoker, and you and you were you know you're on the surface, you could go to the fin 
and you had a break, you could have a cigarette, you know, on, on the bridge or whatever. And, you know, there was no issue with that. But obviously, you couldn't smoke, smoke, couldn't smoke below decks. But I think it was only, only recent, early two thousands, where things changed drastically for submarines. Where there was like a golden age of submariners, where they were like, you know, genuine pirates with a disregard for for anything, for their own safety or anyone else's, where, you know, they weren't even wearing rig, they, you know, they weren't even in uniform half the time, they were, you know, shirtless or, you know, wearing what they wanted, you know, there, there was a lot of alcohol on board, and, you know, there was a, a previous generation of boats, S boats, which were before the T boats, and everyone was like, they were infamous for just party boats, basically, they were out, you know, they were out of control, in, in <laughs> you know, even when they were out working, they were like, you know, hammered or you know half cutting around half naked pissed up just like in charge of the the torpedoes or the the tea lamps or whatever but <laughs> you know so the, a, a real golden age but you know it's like anything nowadays you have to you have to toe the line do you get a lot of uh turbulence if that's the right word when you when you when you're submerged do you get does the boat move about a lot i mean or is it smooth what is it like it's on the surface it's, it's, it's 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 yeah right, i mean on it? on the surface that they're, they're insanely unstable because because the, they've got a round hole and you know some of them they've got their, you know the fins uh, uh, you know wings that they look like at the back but you know if you get a swell or, or some choppy water and you know the boats rolling all all kinds of all, all kinds of ways and even if you're at periscope depth, if there's a big swell, you can the boat will you'll feel it sort of lifting up and going down, as as you know as with the swell. Even though you you could be, you know, quite a few meters still below the the surface, um, but once you're really deep, um, then it, it's like being on an aeroplane in that you, it's generally smooth, but sometimes you'll get a little bit of a bump, like turbulence, if you're changing like water temperature and things like that and when and when the boat moves for example if it's doing a quite a, um, a steep evasive maneuver it moves like an airplane so it'll bang over and then it'll like, go up or down you know whatever you're doing so it's that kind of feeling of, of of being on a plane when when it's going like fast and deep so it's a it's a funny experience um but yeah on the surface it's horrible like, it's really it's really rough i mean you, you know sometimes it's so rough that even even if we are you know, dived and were periscope depth or a bit deeper, you'll be strapped into, I mean, you've seen how small those racks are anyway, but you'll be strapped in with a seatbelt to try and get some, some kip because you, the the boat's rocking so violently that you'd be out, you'd, you know, you'd be out of your bunk if you if you didn't strap, you, literally strap yourself in to, to go to sleep. So, yeah, it can be, can be rough depending how deep you are. Do they allow a women to jump to go on submarines yet? They are allowed now on their bombers. I'm not sure how that how that works. So the nuclear deterrent they're they're allowed on there. I'm not sure. They the V class. The V class. So I think that's because their their boats are a lot bigger. They're like three times the size of the of the um, T boats, and I think maybe the size can allow them to have different accommodation for for women on there. But you know, it's caused it's caused some ructions already with with you know relations on board. There's people like lost their jobs over it. Yeah, I can it already. Does, you yeah. know, even even like senior command, you know, command, um, you know, second in demand, second in command of a boat lost his job because some people underneath him had had a relationship. It wasn't, you know, wasn't even anything to do with that guy. But they're saying like, you know, they're under your command. You should have kept an eye on it. You know, you're gone as well. So it's causing. Yeah, causing they need to wise up to that issues. though. I mean, because yeah. the thing is, with with the military becoming more, you know, trying to get more equality, like, um, yeah, sexual equality in there. It's, it's the same same problem with the army man. Yeah. It, it seems a simple thing to go. Yeah, we can allow women into whatever units, you know. On on um, man, and it, arguably, it's easier to accommodate that on ops. Yeah. Right. But it's in camp. It's in base is the problem. I mean, when I say it's easy to accommodate on ops, that's from my perspective. Being out on the ground, it's not from a submarine perspective, yeah. right? Yeah. Which again, so that be, when I'm saying it's harder to accommodate in base or in camp, or in a or in a boat, for example, it's harder to accommodate it because because like you just said, because emotions, men and women mix in, yeah. and that's just that side of it. Then you bring in all the um, the the change in infrastructure you need. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to make 
it, well, I, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but it's a fucking nightmare. Yeah. It's a nightmare. A, mi- a minefield. The, the reality is, is that relationships, are, are, it's going to happen. The problem is, is that I, I don't think, well, in that case, he just said where that guy got sacked. That's not great. But it's going to have to be, you know, th- those relationships are going to happen in whatever way, shape or form they happen. It's going to be down to those people involved to make adult decisions yeah, about how, it, and, it, it, how, how exactly. and how it affects. Exactly. They're, yes. You know, they're all adults. They're all respon- You know, they're all responsible adults and arguably, you know, highly trained, whatever branch of the military you're in. So, you, you know, people need to take responsibility for their own actions. You know, if they decided to to do that, as long as they, you know, wasn't compromising the safety of the boat or the operation and whatever they're doing, then, you know, they, they should be allowed to get on with it, with their lives as adults, you know. But it's not for us to, to decide. No. Question for you, though. Yeah. Right, because when we've been talking, I've been thinking about Hunt for Red October. Yeah. I've been thinking about Classic. Torah, Torah, Torah. I'm thinking about, oh, no, that's, a, that's an airplane movie, isn't it? Yeah, Torah, not, Torah, Torah. That's not a submarine. Is, that, is it? Yeah, but they're special as well, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the U-boat? No, it is Torah, 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 isn't it? Is it? With the, are the German U-boats? Yeah, I think, no. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, I don't, right. I don't so I've been su- thinking about submarine films. Yeah. How close have you? Uh, what's the closest you've got to a uh, an, uh, a foreign uh, a foreign uh, a foreign vessel without being detected? Well, <laughs> I've heard this dit right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and you know, I don't know whether it's true or whether it was even a British submarine involved. But so the story goes, they're out there. Spying on a on a on a foreign vessel, and um, I believe it was you know it was a new vessel. It, it was you know it was un- unknown to the Allied forces, so you know there was valuable intelligence to be had. And the story goes that they were keeping a close eye on this this vessel when someone realised it was actually coming towards them full steam, full steam ahead. <coughs> and, they, 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 you know, they, they have no way of getting out of the way, so they di- they dive the boat and hope for the best. And they, and this uh, the foreign vessel scrapes right over the top, literally scrapes right over the top no. of of this boat to, to, the, to the point where they could actually... When the when the vessel got back, so the story goes, that they they could re, you know they, so the submarines on the outer casing have specialist tiles, so basically help with you know sonar signature and, and and radar and all that. And the story goes that they could actually remove some of this foreign vessel's tiles from the from the boat when they got back in. They could actually recover some of this technology, and turns out you know somebody got a commendation for it because <laughs> what 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 was potentially a disastrous event of, of, of a collision you know turned into a like hands-on intelligence gathering um operation but so yeah really close problem it's, with those dates is you never know if they're true or not you never know and i, I never mean know. it sounds pretty far-fetched to me sounds but far-fetched. but but you know i'm guessing in some in some situations they get pretty close to <laughs> to, 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 uh, and 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 the, and the and the date is with that that it was you know still undetected by by the foreign um, vessel be- because of the sheer size of it it was just like nothing had you know literally nothing had happened so yeah cra- crazy dates that's a good probably false date that's a probably false date but it sounds good and we've got a, we've got a, you know big up the submariner summer you, you have to right but, um, yeah no. Um, some 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 crazy dates like that, you know, and even going into you know the dates of going into f- to foreign areas undetected, you know, really close to shore is some like, you know, take some some nerve, and in you, you hear that some some foreign powers powers will, um, you know, put mine, you know, even though it's illegal, putting mines down to prevent this kind of thing happening, you know, but allegedly it still happens. I mean, that takes a bit of bit of nerve. So, question for you then. In that kind of situation, um, because you would have been taught this in training, maybe 
Well, I'm not alleging that you've done it in real life. Yeah. But when you're going somewhere and it is really like uber covert now, because as I learned was on HMS Talent, okay, one thing that uh, were amazed me, <coughs> so when you see it in the films, <coughs> See other films. You hear the sonar. You're in the. You're in the. What do they call that? The control room. The cons. The, what? Yeah, just like the. the, the um, you know, with the, the bridge. Sonar, like the, the bridge. The, the control bridge. room. Yeah. And you, on the films you watch it, you can hear the sonar and that. When yeah. I was on HMS Talent and we were in there, my hearing was okay then, <laughs> back then, back in those days. Yeah. And uh, I could hear the ping from from other vessels sonars. Like I could audibly hear the ping coming through the. Of the sound coming, and I and I, I remember saying, well, "What's that?" And they said, oh, it's, "That's the sonar. You can. It's an actual sound that goes through the ocean." Yeah. I didn't realize that. Oh yeah. So, can, so my point of saying, don't. Oh, I'm, I'm just smiling it. because it reminded me of something else. Underwater so, sound, but we'll get on to that. All right. So, question is, when you that, uh, and the reason I tell that story is because that's how easily tra sound travels in the ocean, and when you have got the sensitive sound detecting equipment, yeah. sonar equipment, right. Yeah. On the other ship, they're trying to detect a boat. Man, you guys, you must what? You must not be able to talk and stuff. Yeah, well, literally, if you're on um, action stations and you're in a in a hostile environment, um, then yeah, literally, you have to whisper and you can't, you know, stomp. You have to be careful how you walk around the the boat because literally, you know, walking up a ladder, they could pick that up. You know, they'll. That's why you know you have the water shortages because they have to turn off, you know, anything that's not essential. They, you know, they turn it off and they're not running. You're not allowed the TV on. They, you know, you know, simple, silly things like TV in the mess. You're not allowed to watch TV because they, they pick up on the on the sound of the TV. You know, all the cooking equipment. Because um, the TV will give off electrical distortion, right? Even well, if not, you have it on a mute. Yeah, there, there's all sorts of different. One is the yeah, frequencies. They, you know, they have equipment that can pick up frequencies. So, so there is that. But and then the other thing is that you know the sound itself. So yeah, you know if you're in that if you're in that environment, literally you whisper, you creep, you're in you're in um, you know red light. You know, like if you'd see on a film like Red October or whatever, and you're in that and you're whispering, sneaking around the boat, and literally, but but, but for hours, like you know, you're in that sort of suspended state of. Um, suspense for for hours at a time, you know, while you're listening. Right. What happens when people snore? You probably probably get kicked. Probably get kicked in the ribs. Is it a common occurrence? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it does. It does happen. But um, yeah, I mean, ge you know, generally you could go and give someone a shove if they were if they're actually being that loud. You know, they they would. It's like deadly serious. I mean, you can, you, you can you know, people laugh about it. But oh, I know. So I'm is, asking. I can is, imagine because you know, it's, it's just the, I I analogize uh, analogize it with you know I'm. Power Edge, and we, you know, we're an infantry unit, and it's, you know, there's times you've got to be fucking silent. I understand it. Yeah. But what's different is, well, it's completely different because you're in your environment, which you're normally operating in, you know, on the boat, and then you've got to be completely silent. You can't walk. You trip over and bang your watch, for example. That's an issue. You snore, for example. Yeah. That's, I mean, just being in a constant state of that. You, you're working back after you drop a spanner or, you know, something like that. It, it's happened, you know. It's not, yeah, because the difference, like, again, going back, the difference is with the way I used to have to operate, and a lot of a lot of other people, not just the infantry, but, but other attached arms, we do, you know, on the ground stuff. Yeah. You, 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 the kit you work with is built to be quiet. You're not working in a metal environment with big, flipping, cl clunky things. Yeah. You, you know, it's as, it's as, you can make it as safe as you want to make it. Yeah, it's, I would not want to be on a boat doing that. I mean, they still they are still even now like give out you know the old Timberland like deck shoes like boat shoes, you know you've seen them with like that people wear them for fashion now you know like that style of shoe, they still give them out for people in the control room. So if you are walking about, you know you've not got your big steaming bats on or your big boots on, you know clumping around the the control room. So the, the, you know, there's still that you know the requirement for for quiet. But it's funny you say about sound traveling, but. One of the I thought it was a massive wind up when when I first joined the the service was that there's a thing called the underwater telephone, Go on. and I'm like, you taking the piss, and because obviously I'm older as well, I'm thinking I'm not having this young kid like taking the piss out of me, telling me about <laughs> you know underwater telephones. He thinks I'm like born yesterday. Do you know what I mean? So, but but it turns out it's a genuine thing that if you're close enough to another vessel. You can just basically broadcast the sound of of your voice through the water, and it'll it'll pick it up. But <laughs> you have to talk like mega slow. So w w when you hear it, it's like, 
Hello. Are you receiving me? <laughs> and I'm like, fuck off. How oh, is that a real thing? You know what I mean? We're on a we're on a boat, you know, mil- millions of a pounds worth of, of the Navy's finest equipment and we've got some bloke, you know, on a loudspeaker under the water talking like that. But it's a genuine <laughs> it's a genuine thing. Like, yeah, the underwater telephone. Um Right. How do we get how do we go? How'd you go from Submariner? So you must have left at thirty seven yeah. to intemperance knives. Talk yeah. me with that. So I mean I you know, like I mentioned with my with my grandfather there when he you know, had some war dits and apparently met um in his time during the war it said he'd met, you know, William Sykes of Bourbon Sykes fame. Um, for those guys developing their knives, and he'd done some time out in in Burma, and you know that that sort of knife fighting knife culture is where the FS knife was kind of the idea was born from. From those guys doing that, um, involved in in that policing and, and different activities in like I think it was Shanghai or somewhere out there in in the east. And so he had a, a lot of dits about about that and um, and knives in general and an interest. And I'd done. Um, engineering when I left school as an apprenticeship and part of that I'd done some some metal work and some blacksmithing and I'd had I'd, I'd made a few um, and had an interest. Um, fast forward to you know oil and gas the Navy um, got injured on uh, on a deployment on on the boat and I'd spent and when I come back I'd spent some time at Headley Court which you know was was open um, <coughs> it's moved now so it, so it's not a military hospital now, but back then, um, Headley Court down in London, I'd spent some time there um, <clears throat> recovering. And um, a part of their like rehab and, and recovery program, they can have you like, you know, going in the work, they have the prosthetics workshop on site there, which I think is manned by, I think RAF engineers or someone like that, man it. But basically because of the, you know, the, a lot of the, the wars, um, ground wars had, 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 had slowed down and they wasn't getting the personnel through through there. It, you know, basically it was there, but they wasn't really doing very much with it. So you could, as a patient, you could go down there and do like woodwork or metal work, just something to get you up and about, out of your room, get you working and moving again. And I thought, oh, I used to enjoy doing that with uh, with like the old knives. So maybe I'll just give that a go. So I just got back into it there. Um, <clears throat> just making some some knives, basically just to give me something to do and just something to as a focus to get me up and about. Um, so it, it was kind of born again then, and that sort of reignited that, reignited that passion that I had from previous talks with my with my granddad and, and all that about the development of these knives. And I thought, yeah, I think I'd love to do that as a you know as a hobby, basically. Um, and then through the wounded, injured, and sick um, sort of environment or, or community if you like uh, before i got discharged ago, i was lucky enough to um to meet like a few americans and go to america um a couple of times and meet some some servicemen there and we were talking about knives and you know development for of knives for you know for military use and and it just sort of grew from there and i thought you know there's more the more i looked into it the more i was excited about being able to do that as a potential way to earn a living but also you know, just interested in 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 continuing a way of being involved with specifically like the military side of things. You know, if I can produce something that could potentially be used by military personnel, you know, I'd love that because then I'd still be involved in you know giving blokes or or women some some decent kit that they could use in that environment. You know, even though I was no longer in uh, in that environment. So, you know, there's a few reasons why I sort of got into it, and then. And I thought if I'm going to do this for real, you know, I need to to, to develop something that's going to be, you know, really usable. I don't just want to do it as a, you know, as token. So yeah, you know, look, you know, look what I've made. I wanted to do it, and I wanted to do it like well and the best, but also fit for for purpose. So it took a lot of research in speaking to guys in the US and and the UK, um, in who were using knives in, in in hostile environments and sort of asking them what their requirements were what they found in the past, what they found now was available. Um, and, and luckily, you know, I got to speak to some some guys who were, you know, hands-on in, in those environments. You know, the U.S. guys who were involved in um, 
some some now involved in some contracting work over there uh, and, and in the Middle East. So they were like talking about concealment and what sort of backup uh, knives they'd use. So got some good input from them. Plus the one of the doctors I had in in part of my recovery, he was um, formally attached to um, pool, so he had some some real hands-on experience, and he was also a bit of a knife a knife guy. So speaking to him quite a lot, and an, and another guy who was formerly the um, at one point was a sergeant major at pool, I become really good friends with with him, and he's also given me some some big input on you know what those guys were using, what worked, what didn't. So I thought, yeah, you know, really, I could do, you know, I could do something with that. So then, you know, the idea was there. Did a bit of like intelligence gathering and started working on some designs. Got them sent out to a couple of different guys for to, some prototypes, for some use, and some feedback. And that's where the sort of the idea was born. Born then, and I thought, you know, I'd really like to give this a a go and turn it into a business. <clears throat> but you know, it just because I knew I, at that point, I knew I was coming out of the military. You know, sadly. You know, I th because I went in so late, I thought I'd be in for life, you know, for life until retirement age. That, that was the plan. But obviously, that was um, that was not going to be the case. I knew I was going to be medically discharged with my uh, my physical injuries. Um, so I just needed to start thinking about a plan, you know, a, pl a plan for coming out, a transition. But you know, it was not easy in in the fact that you know we live in the UK and knives are for some people are a taboo subject, you know, and some companies who, who would traditionally help veterans in recovery pathways or transitions they wouldn't touch it because of the nature of it um you know some other charities were like well we can't give you money for a startup for this because it because of the nature of what you're doing so even within you think like the veteran community and the, and the charities are helping veterans transition even within that environment even though we're coming from a military environment where these are legitimate you know military tools or tools for campcraft or survival or whatever there was still that resistance to to you know just to the fact it was knives so it's been really difficult to set up a company um around knives and, and especially sort of tactical knives because you know people just don't don't want to be associated with it in in a, in a corporate you know in a corporate uk environment yeah it'd have to be a specific kind of company or in a specific kind of industry for that i mean it's the, it's the whole you know, it's the whole bearded veteran thing, right? Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, um, it's a challenge, but you know, I mean, it can be overcome. I mean, can't we've, it? we've got there. You know, we've got we've got products to market now, like you know, proven, um, proven, you know, knives fit for purpose. You know, for tactical applications, and then you know, we, we've got there, and it's you know, it's early days for 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 us as a company, but you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty excited with with where it can go. You know, given our UK military, something that, that I, you know, I believe was missing in, in that, you know, tactical knives, you know, there's n not many people I know or any companies I know in the UK that are doing what we're doing with, with you know, handmade tactical knives. There's, you know, there's plenty of knife makers out there, custom knife makers, but actually saying, look, this is what we do, these are our core products, you know, I don't know anyone else that's actually doing that. So... Which is what specifically? Which is specific tactical knives. Tactical knives, you know, for 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 hard use situations. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there's plenty of people doing sort of bushcraft knives and that kind of thing, which is which is good, but they're not always fit for purpose in a you know military environment, which mm -hmm. is which is what prim primarily our knives are designed for. Yeah, and 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 your knives look alley, mate. Yeah, exactly, they, and they, they, they look good. But but that's just you know they were developed for a specific purpose, and that's how they look. You know, so they you know they were designed for for a function. It just so happens that they do that. You know, they look they look the business as well. But that's not you know I didn't want to design good looking knives. You know, I just wanted to design knives that I that I do a job. How was the um? How has when did you set it up? So before you left? Yeah, so before I left, um, started on the prototypes, um, you know, a couple of years, a couple of years back, um, and then just started getting them out to friends, people I knew who was, who was still out there, um, and then, you know, getting the feedback from them, and then we, we got sort of finalised the, the final lineup, um, probably just in time for me to, to leave, and then just being sort of steadily growing over the last year into the point now where i've just come to um 
started on the social media on Instagram, which I wasn't really doing before. Um, so started to try and promote it on the on you know on the socials and and in the veteran community. What's trying. the what's the Instagram handle? So it's intemperance underscore knives. Temperance underscore knives. Yeah, and you can see obviously the link to our website um, on there. But oh, you got a website set up already, have you? Yeah. So there, there's a if you look on the profile, there's a link to the website there. So yeah, we're fully fully good to go. But what I didn't want to do is as a business is just come to you know, start putting it out there, but then saying, yeah, but, you know, we've not got a website or, you know, we're, we're working on this, but it's not ready yet. You know, I wanted to come to market with, a, you know, with, with the products ready to go, with, you know, with everything ready, um, and, uh, you know, and being able to, to provide it, um, you know, straight off the bat rather than saying, you know, I've got this idea, but, you know, it's a few months in the working or whatever. Yeah, I think it's become a little... I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I've been, been talking to a couple of companies, veteran-owned, just to help try and support them. And um, in fact, you know what? I've spoken to... I spoke to two, two this morning. Uh, three, in, three in the last two days. So two this morning, one yesterday. Yeah. None of them got a website. No. Uh, no, I tell a lie. One of them's got a website. I, I think it's madness. Well, I, well, the reason I'm reading it up is I, I think these days it's not as much madness, right? Because... You have, because really, I think all a website provides these days for a company that sells a product, right? Yeah. I think really, when we're talking about what social media is like these days, all a website provides is a, is a, the main thing is a, is a, is a, a function to, to, to pay. It's a function to pay. Yeah. Or, and then the secondary role is to persuade you to buy. Because you, because to get to a website, right? These days, right? People will find your website, yeah, through Instagram. Yeah, it, it goes through social media first. Yeah, right. That's how yeah. it. That's yeah. how it happens. Exactly, these days. And, that's, uh, and that's why we've come. You know, started the, the but, Instagram. But what what the facilities you are, you have on social media now is you can you can do everything from generate a lead. Yeah generate a lead through a potential customer to sell them the product which yep. even having a website you can sell on instagram you can sell on facebook unless, and that's what i'm saying i think website thing unless you're a knife company because they, they it goes against their community guidelines so i can't pay you know like you could do a paid promotion to promote your profile on instagram as a business i can't do that because it because the you know but the business is selling knives it goes against their, their guidelines so we can't promote any of our um, posts or stories or you know any anything of that nature we we can't promote it on instagram and we can't have a um as far as i'm aware the last time i tried to do it they, they wouldn't allow it you know you can just set up to buy the products through instagram like you say you can click on a post and it'll show the product and the price or well, because it's because of the nature of what we do they don't you know they won't allow uh, that function that's a pain in the ass yeah it's been difficult honestly you know even to get um, a bank account for the company. You know, we're we're a limited company. You know, fully legit. But even you know, even back in the early days, to get in a bank account because we we were a knife company, the mainstream banks were like, nah, that's bonkers. No, thanks. but if you sell alcohol or sell tobacco, <laughs> you can go and get a bank account. It's crazy. That's mental. It's unbelievable. It's the twenty first century. Do it, but you know, we're we're how do cutlery companies do it? How yeah. do cutlery companies do it? Uh, no, I don't. I don't know. I think if we were you know, there's a lot of companies I do do like chef's knives and that sort of thing. And I think if you, maybe if you were more that way inclined as a, as a company, they, they, you know, they might be, a, they might tolerate a bit more or, or there might be ways around it. But because of the, the core products of what we do, then they, they wouldn't allow it. But I was adamant that, look, you know, this is what we, we want to do as a company. That there's a need for it, you know. And in society, like you can't ignore the fact that people in you know especially in the military environment they go and do a certain job and they need certain tools to do it you know and this is uses this is part of that requirement and you can't just if you don't like it you can't pretend it doesn't happen you know it happens people people need this stuff and as long as we're being responsible as a company and we're not you know we've got the eight the age guidelines on on the website and the, and before people buy and plus the prices they you know they're high-end um knives the you know the premium prices so they're not really accessible to you know somebody younger who might be 
irresponsible and going out to, to do something it's you know, just irresponsible. Stupid. So they wouldn't come to you for that anyway. It's like, been difficult. It's, they would go somewhere, which can sound nice, is that a problem? They would go yeah, to exactly. Asda and pick up a fucking kitchen knife. Yeah. Or they would go to the local DIY pound, shop. Or the pound land. Yeah, exactly. Or they get their 18 year old, 19 year old, 20. Or pound land. Yeah. Cousin, they go in there and go to fucking pound land they, again. That just frustrates me about, you know, it's probably another controversial topic if we ever got onto you know to I like, love, like I knife, love it. Love it. knife crime. Have you seen my baseball cover? You know, knife <laughs> knife crime UK. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the statistics, one one it's massively political, you know, depending on like policing and funding, that there's a you know, that's a massive element. But I'm not saying there's not, you know, in some in some areas it's not an issue. But if you look at what's involved in like you say in that crime, it'll be a screwdriver or a chisel. Or a knife from the pound, like you know, he can't bring every tar everyone with that same brush and um, and say because you know because you make knives, you're responsible or you're irresponsible company. You know, it just doesn't. It's just yeah, it's it's not it's not right, and it's not you know, it's like this cancel culture. They can't just pretend we don't exist because they don't like it or don't fit in with uh, you know their their agenda. So how are you selling? Have you got distributors? No, so we sell we sell direct. From from our website, um, I was in some early talks with a couple of um, sort of knife distributors in here and in Europe, uh, a European one. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether we'll go down down that route. Route um, depends, I guess, how how the company grows and what the demand is. The, the other issue is obviously if you sell into America, is that you know the the import um, tax that, that that they have to pay. But you know. Um, so I'm not sure whether we'd need to put some with a distributor in the US. I'm not sure. I think it's too uh, too early to 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 say. We've sent some out there, you know, just as as private customers that have been buying them. So, you know, it's not on it's not unreasonable. People expect that if you know they're buying some from from the UK, then they, you know there's a there's an import tax, same as if we were buying from the US. But that was another reason why. You know, I had some feedback from a guy the other day, um, a parachute, someone from the parachute regiment who would bought one of our knives and he'd messaged me and said, you know, it's good to find like a tactical knife, but in, in the UK and they don't, we don't have to pay, you know, import tax from the U S and that was another reason why I wanted to do it is because to give our guys access to the same things like some of the American guys have got, but without having to pay the, you know, they've got something that's British made. It's a veteran company and they don't have to pay crazy extortion, you know, import taxes to, to, to get their hands on it. So, Where'd you do? Where'd you do it all, mate? Where, where, you, where are you making them? Well, started off um, making it in a, in my in my shed. Well, obviously the hospital was where it first started. Then got uh, then it got a shed. Hang on, you, hang on, hang on. You started making knives in the hospital. Yeah, the, how'd it, you do that? A headlock. Yeah, in but, the, uh, but in uh, well, yeah, I sneaked in. <laughs> I sneaked in the <laughs> sneaked in the steel, and just didn't really advertise to to you know the powers that be what I was actually doing. <laughs> And just cracked on, just cracked on with it, you know, on the on the DL. But um, yeah, no, literally, I couldn't. The there was like I was working with like one of the occupational health nurses there, and I was like, "Look, this is what I'm doing." She's like, "Well, you know, just don't just don't tell anyone else about it, will you?" I'm like, "Okay," but um, so yeah, controversial was a nice in the hospital, but you know, so that's where it started, and then now we've got um a bigger workshop in Huddersfield, so we we, we do everything from there, and we've got other people that do. Um, there's Seracote, which is the ceramic curtain that we use. Um, we've got a guy down in Essex who who, who specialises in that. So we, we don't do that in house because that's a specialist um, a specialist thing. So we get him to do that, and then the, the knives come back to us for for sharpening and, and sending out. But yeah, everything's done on, on site in 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 Yorkshire. From from start to finish, how long does it take to make a knife? Uh, depending assuming, on assuming the design is done yeah assuming the design i mean that was the hardest thing was getting the designs nailed but you know now the design's done you're looking at maybe maybe six or seven hours um to get pre pre ready to uh to be coated so you're looking at a, 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 say it goes to be coated and comes back sharp. so you're looking at probably 15 to to 16 hours on our side, plus you've got the side of the guy who's doing the, the coating. So, you know, 15, 16 hours plus his better time. So 20 hours maybe, all told, for, for one knife. 
So what about the uh, are you, so apart from the, the the steel bits? Yeah. What about the other like the handle that isn't steel and stuff like that? Who's manufacturing those? Is that you? Yeah. Well, so no. We, when we we use um, primarily we use like G10, which is um, you know common now in in the knife and gun industry. There's a lot of gun scales handles are used. They use G10 because it's really what's G10? It's G10. So it's a it's a laminate. It's a glass laminate product so, so i'll show you one of the knives and, it, and that i brought and it and it's um it's ma it's really grippy hey, well grab it now when you're talking yeah, I'll, 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 I'll grab one now don't run off come back grab the deodorant that's what he's doing Rush his tash he's in his admin bag yeah i was trying to i was while we were talking i was trying to bring up the instagram look intemperance underscore knives how oh, fuck he brought an axe I brought the G10. Jump back down behind that mic. Oh, right. Okay. So if you look from oh, mate, the... That feels like bloody steel, that. I can try yeah. to hold this up. So it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's really tough. Um, you know, it's temperature resistant, it's chemical resistant, but it's still really grippy. So if you've got wet hands or bloody hands, you know, you're still going to be able to grip. I see you've been using this. Yeah, that's a demo one. So we did it. You know, if you'll see on the Instagram, we smashed a car up with that. <laughs> literally, literally, you could take the chop. <laughs> literally, we, literally, we could chop the ch car roof off with with with, with the axe. Like, could ch could chop through the uh, the column, you know, the center column or whatever it's called. There's another one. Oh, right. So, so that, that that seems lighter than what it should be as well. It's yeah. good good weight to it. So that was part of the design was you know having something that was heavy enough to I do. Wasn't, I wasn't complaining by the way. I was saying it, that's good. No. So I mean, you know, it's that's a it's qu it's quarter inch thick. This this axe so i mean it's a heavy you know it's a hefty piece of steel but you know we engineered it to be um you know light enough to carry on your kit and wield uh, but but still heavy enough where it could you know you could breach with it you know you could help you get through locks or through doors or through windows you know and that's why it's got the pry bars at the bottom so so it's not just you know dead weight you can do multiple things with with, with one piece of kit you know and that was the, the idea behind that i think this is a boot knife that, yeah, my boot, boot on, neck carry. Well, I designed that flat because a lot of guys who were carrying on, on a plate with plate carriers, you know, if you've got a, a bulky sort of traditional round handle shape in a sheath, you know, that was, it was bulky on the kit and they want it to be as close as possible to their, to their body. So we designed it, or designed all of the first range tactical knives. We designed them all really flat for that, for that reason. So when you've got them carried on you, plate or, or wherever it is on your kit you know it's a slit it's a lower profile so that was the reason behind Mate, the, the design the I hold out to the camera though that's proper light but well. this g10 that's an interesting material isn't it yeah i mean it's like it's like i say it's really it's really hard wearing it's really um it's heat resistant you know it's chemical resistant so you, you know we need something that's going to be stand up to the abuse that you know, you could potentially give the knives or the environment that you're potentially going to be in with the knives. And we do, you, I mean, if you see, we do like a wooden handled version of the dagger, but but purely for aesthetics, you know, people like to have that wooden... The FS dagger. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so we do like a modern version of, of that. So we call it a combat dagger, because obviously you can't call it the FS dagger, but basically it's designed for the same principle it, it, as, as the FS knife. Uh, it's a double-edged dagger, but we do with a broader tip so one of the thing, one of the feedback that I got from guys who were u actually using the FS is that the tips would often break off. They'd often ping ping the tips off. So we did a broader, broader tip. So it was a bit more robust and stand up to a bit more abuse. And we do a wooden handled version of that. But again, we use a stabilized wood, which means that it's it's been injected with a, a resin, so it won't you know it won't crack or fatigue with you know water or sunlight. It's not as durable as the G10, but you know, if you were still wanted to take it into that kind of environment, it would it would stand up to it. But mainly, that's for aesthetics. You know, the old school guys like a like a wooden a wooden handle. And we, you know, we're going to do more things. We've got some coming out next year where we've got camo, actually where this is um, black um, cerakote. We've got camo um, pattern, so it's actually ceramic curtain, but it's got the camo you'd have baked onto it basically That's clever. so it's going to look you know it's going to look pretty good you know and functional but and, and hand wire, hard wearing rather than just looking good it's actually going to be you know functional so we've got them coming in the new year so pretty excited about that but we just wanted to start off with the you know the flat black 
um, range, first of all, you know. It's Ali Kett, Thanks. This is Ali Kett. Yeah, it's mega. But mega. yeah, so we're, you know, pretty excited about it. And like I said, you know, we don't, don't know anyone else in the UK that's doing this right now. He's just pure, purely focused on the, on the tactical side. Good, mate. It's going well. It seems to be going well for you. Um, <coughs> hope it continues. We've, yeah. we've, uh, we, Anything else we haven't talked about that you want to talk about? No, I don't think so. We've got, obviously, on the knives, you know, my craziness of joining the, the military later on. I mean, there's, there's um, you know, our, our come to be to be out of the, the military was, you know, pre, pretty unpleasant. I think we touched on that about me being stuck, you know, stuck on board for, for no, a no, few no, weeks. No, we didn't talk about that at all. We I talked about that before. Ah. Yeah, so we... So <laughs> You know, when we're we're on an operation in 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 area, um, we, you know, obviously where we where, where we sh- you know arguably shouldn't have been, and uh, I came a cropper and ended up with some uh, some nerve damage and and some damage to my back, um, and because of the because of the nature of the operation and where we were, you know, I was stuck on board for almost five weeks before we got, we you know we finished the job we were there to do, and then. By the time we, you know, sailed back to, to a, like a neutral area where I could be casivacked, casivacked off. So that was, you know, that was like a, you know, glamorous end to, <laughs> to my very brief um, military career. But you know that, you know, it was it was it was bad at the time. But you know, without that happening, you know, I wouldn't be where I am now with, you know, with the company and and doing something, you know, I'm equally, arguably more passionate passionate about. So. You know, maybe everything happens for a reason, and you know that's where I am now. Mate, mega, it is mega. I know, like you said, sometimes shit goes pear shit, but you come out smelling the rose the other side in yeah. some way, shape, or form. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it's good being your own boss, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, so far so good. Yeah, apart from you know, get pressure from the misses about. <laughs> Sold any more knives today? <laughs> yeah, there's a few going on. But. But you know, but yeah, no, it's good. You know, it's good. I'm excited. You know, we've got some good feedback from from guys in, you know, in the military and and surrounding industries about the knives. And I think, you know, it's not all, it's not always about the the money. You know, the money side is good. Because obviously, as a company, you need to be viable. But you know, if we're providing stuff that's useful to guys who are still doing a shit job, you know. Then you know that that's 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 the reward diff- for me. A difficult job, shit job, yeah, a difficult job, yeah. difficult job. Yeah, I mean that that's the reward for me. You know, getting feedback from people who who are, who are using this on on, you know, in, in live action places uh, environments, and they get and you're getting good feedback. You know, that's enough for me. You know, I don't you don't I, you know I don't care about how many I sell. You know, just to just to know that they're they're out there doing a good job and they've helped some you know some people, and you and you know once once we get more established as a as a company, it would be good to be able to start giving back to you know to the veteran community in 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 terms like veteran charities and things like that because you know having been been through it and been through the the wounded injured and sick side you know you see how how you know some people are struggling with with getting access to certain things and I just think you know some some of the charities there you know we could could do with a, a little bit of a help and a bit of a boost and I, and I'll be glad you know when our company can can be in a position to to help those guys out as well you know help the charities out. Yeah, mega, mega. Last question: Why is why uh, why is it called intemperance knives? Yeah, yeah funny one. Um, it just we just wanted a, I just wanted a name that would you know stand out for one you know something that was memorable. But intemperance, like basically the the interpretation is like you know without moderation. So like without um, you know sort of to to. Um, you know, to to with like abundance, so basically doing something and doing it sort of a bit over the top, which is kind of like what we wanted to do is like you know sort of overbuild our knives and you know without without holding back basically, which is what we wanted to do with you know with the idea. So hence intemperance, and, and plus I thought it sounded it sounded good. <laughs> What's the website? As well, so the the it's uh, www.intemperancenives.com. Intemperancenives.com yeah. and it's intemperance underscore knives on Instagram. Yeah, that's the one. Aaron, it's been a pleasure talking to you, mate. Thanks a lot, mate. We'll do it again. Thank you. Sweet.